Well, welcome to the final lecture of the Bioinformatics Module for Honors. I'm glad you guys have held in here, even though there's no quiz over the, uh, the material that we're covering just now. Um, but I, I really feel like the subject of biological pathways and networks is actually quite an important one, and I hope that you will find this useful in uh, all of the research that you're going to do. At some point, you're, you're going to want to know what this gene does, how does this gene fit in with all the others that, of which we're aware, and biological pathways and networks are a natural way to uh, begin learning that. So uh, I want to note that, again, Bing Zhang uh, provided an awful lot of the slides that I've used here uh, to stock out the story. So uh, I, I really appreciate what he's had to contribute. So we're going to start with a discussion of gene sets, uh, discussing basically three different routes to, to go for analysis, one being just pathways in general, one being the gene ontology, which is in some ways uh, a pathway, uh, and network module analysis as well. From that, we're going to talk about enrichment analysis to essentially say, um, in this set of genes, which pathways, which network modules are most, uh, are most closely associated with this activity. So for that, we're going to talk about the Web Gestalt framework uh, and along the way as, as well, discuss this gene set enrichment analysis. So I, I think you remember uh, seeing this figure from this morning as we were talking about graph is. Um, what I wanted to capture here is how all of this stuff connects together. So over at the right, you can read these as uh, things that you can do or things that you can accomplish through pathway or network analysis. Over at the extreme left, these mustard colored ones, we can think of those as sources for uh, the information we use to associate one gene with another. Uh, and then here we have sort of our point to point network, uh, the biological networks that we're constructing and the canonical pathways, these being the uh, the systems like gene ontology that we've looked at. Gene ontology is special in that it has this controlled vocabulary uh, aspect tied to it. So I, I hope that these, uh, that some of the terms that you see over at the left are not confusing to you. i to focus a little bit here. So obviously we were able to learn something about what proteins and genes do using classical methods before we had proteomics, before we had genomics, before we had transcriptomics. Uh, so a lot of people have invested a lot of years of their lives into, uh, into discerning some of the canonical pathways that exist within our, our, our bodies. So maybe the, the big example of this is the, is the carboxylic acid, uh, the, well, the TCA uh, cycle, uh, the central respiration. You know, what do you, what do you do with glucose once you've broken it down to pyruvate? So these three carbon sugars, how do they produce uh, the, the more immediate uh, types of energy that we make use of? So, Things like that uh, are sort of the, the bare bones upon which we built our initial understandings of gene-to-gene -gene relationships. Certainly, the microarray has been used so broadly and in such a wide variety of growth phases and uh, stimulations for cells that we have been able to use this to recognize sets of genes that always show up together. So if you had a, uh, you know, 20 different uh, stimulations or growth phases for a bug, one of the things that you might be able to do is discover which genes are up in the same patterns of stimulations and growth phases and which ones are down in the same. So you can use that information to judge that if these two, pro if these two genes are transcribed at the same time uh, under the same circumstances, their, their activities may be, uh, well, we, we can judge at least that the transcripts are correlated and from that we might infer that their functions are linked. So, one of the, the obvious examples of this is that if you have a, a polycystronic gene in a bacterium and you have multiple transcripts, that's uh, right, you have, you have a single transcript that leads to multiple uh, gene products, one of the things that we infer about that is that the, the two proteins coded for by the, one, uh, by the, the, by the single transcript are going to be in, in, a, in, in the same pathways, in effect. So, the microarray correlation approach is not that distant from it. It simply says if these transcripts are produced under the same circumstances, the same functions are, are likely to be coded for by that. So you can call this a, a guilt by association method. Essentially, if, uh, you know, if, you, if, we, if we look over your calendar and your best friend's calendar, we see that there's a lot of places where you, uh, there's a lot of places and times where you two show up together. So if your friend is uh, being tried uh, for a crime, you might be too, uh, through guilt by association. So that's the microarray correlation route. 
Uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation is a, a chip style experiment. If you're able to, uh, to, uh, to, to recognize that these genes uh, and interactivity under the same circumstances, then you might, or under the, uh, by the same product, you might judge that, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, the transcription events are linked. So chip experiments are, are valuable for that. Protein immunoprecipitation is quite valuable. You, you may have an antibody that's, very, that's specific to a particular protein, and you yank that out of solution. So in yanking that out of solution, you may have grabbed some other proteins that also uh, interact with that protein quite strongly. So this gives you the ability to say, aha, these proteins have a shared interface. Therefore, uh, these proteins are similar in the, the reactivities that they exhibit. So protein immunoprecipitation and chromatin immunoprecipitation have played a role in our understanding the interaction between genes and the interaction between protein products. Yeast 2 hybrid is a method that was hugely in favor of a couple decades back. Uh, yeast 2 hybrid is a very good way of discerning uh, proteins that interact with each other in, in cells. Uh, in effect, if the, if the two proteins uh, come together in, within the cell, then you, you get a product that you can measure. Now, yeast 2 hybrid is a little problematic in that it tends to produce a fair number of false positives, that proteins that just spontaneously happen to be close together trigger a false positive signal from yeast 2 hybrid. So that's not quite so lovely as we might like, but it's been valuable and it's produced an awful lot of the interaction maps that we work with. And of course, confocal co-localization uh, co is quite valuable. If you're able to use a technique like FRET, where two dyes in proximity uh, produce a fluorescence, uh, then you might be able, by confocal microscopy, to say these two, pro these two gene products are uh, found in the same parts of the cell because of this, uh, this signal that we can measure. So this is an optical way to do this measurement. So all of these different experimental methodologies have led to our understanding there are relationships between genes. Sometimes that's directional, and sometimes it's not directional. So think about the example of a transcription factor. A transcription factor is something that leads to transcription at a certain set of genes. That transcription factor is not universal, though. It's not that all genes, if this transcription factor happens to interact with its DNA, you suddenly get transcription. Instead, there's a subset of the genes for that particular organism that are triggered by this particular transcription factor. So this is an example, this is an example of a, a directional impact. When this transcription factor is produced, these genes are regulated. It doesn't work the other way. If you see that, that is, those genes are, uh, that some of that a gene of, or of this set is being transcribed, it doesn't mean that the transcription factor must necessarily be there because there may be other things that are controlling the, the transcription of that gene. So we think of this as a, as a causal relationship and thus a directed edge in this plot, that this transcription factor leads to this family of transcripts being activated. Okay, so th that's uh, what we would say about the relationships. Uh, once we bring in a controlled vocabulary, this is sort of like a dictionary essentially, you can have a gene ontology that's built from these relationships and the controlled vocabulary. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about a lot of these other issues uh, later on in the course of the talk, so I'm, I'm going to pass on the red stuff for now. All right, so let's talk about the laundry list problem. If you have done an experiment by microarray or RNA-seq or proteomics, you probably have some sort of difference list to work with. You remember our friend the volcano plot? Well. Here we have genes that are down in our sample that are significant in the p-values that they produce. That's a list then of, pro of, of, uh, micro of uh, transcripts that we care about that are, that are seen to be differential. And on the other side, we have transcripts that are up and produce significant p-values. And we want to know what are these genes, what are, what the, what are the transcripts that they produce. Uh, what kinds of functions do those represent? If I just give you a list of 70 differences and tell you to knock yourself out, uh, you, you, know, you don't really know which of these should be prioritized over others. To what extent is this list redundant, in fact? So if you have a list of genes with potential biological interest, whether they come out of a volcano plot style analysis or through gene clustering, 
you still need to be able to summarize that to produce some sort of executive roll-up that makes the biology that, that, that distills the biology out of this list of interesting genes. So one might imagine that we could simply say, well, what do I know about the first gene? What do I know about the second gene? What do I know about the third gene or the fourth gene? That is useful. But it sometimes helps to rearrange this on the other, on the other uh, end. If we pull out pathway one and ask which of the genes is associated with pathway one, we see that one and two are. If we look at pathway two, we see that gene one and three are, are linked. If we pull out pathway three, well, we get three genes that are. So these, these uh, pullouts that we do can help us to organize these differently. Um, so this reorganization of hanging genes off of pathways changes this from a gene-by-gene gene assessment to a grouping, a biological grouping of these genes instead. So one of the first things that falls out of that is better interpretability. So we may have started with interesting genes, but now by having looked at groups of genes, grouping together those that are in the same pathway, we get biological themes out of our data. We're also more robust that we're able to uh, be robust against variation that made these genes look differential, but wasn't really. So being able to summarize across these sets gives us a smaller number overall of these sets of genes for us to consider. And in court, of course, improved sensitivity is awfully nice as well. So if you have five different genes, each of which are up by 30%, some of which, but not all of which, get significant p-values, you're going to be a little hard-pressed to decide whether this, the, those individual genes in that set are really differential. But in grouping them together, the signal uh, rises above the noise, because these five are known to be part of the same pathway, and their signals buttress each other. So this is one way in which we can improve experimental interpretation by thinking about it from a pathway perspective rather than a by-gene uh, assessment. And along the way, uh, we can also make some improvements on the multiple testing front. Because remember, if you're trying to do a thousand different t-tests uh, to get a, a set of genes that are differential, multiple testing is going to eat you alive. But if you have the ability to project them into pathways before deciding which pathways are differential, things may get better. So there are lots of databases out there, BioCarta, K, Medisic, all of these. Um, we're going to spend a little more time thinking about K. In fact, there's a little representation down here at the lower right to give you that example. But there's going to be this problem as we try to look across all of these different tools that we might use. One is limited coverage. As we saw this morning, just because a gene is, is, uh, is sure in its annotation from the, the genome does not mean that we know what that gene's function is. And frankly, we, we frequently see that uh, even members of the same genus may have very different sets of, of genes for us to examine. That, uh, you know, if you compare uh, two bacteria from the same genus, for example, you may find that the, the, uh, there, there are overlapping genes to, to examine, overlapping functionality to examine, and yet a fairly large number of genes for each of those species still goes without an explanation. So uh, the, the next thing I'd go to is, in, uh, I'm sorry, what that means is that just because we know that something is a gene does not mean that we know how it operates, what its function is. Okay, inconsistency among different databases is a big issue as well. There are people who've tried to tie together resources like these to put together a kind of a community assessment of, well, there are three different databases that agree that these proteins all belong to this particular pathway. And there's another three members that two of the, uh, two of the resources agree on. So this inconsistency has been a challenge. Uh, likewise, the relationship between pathways is not always recognized. We're going to see how this gets dealt with in the context of the gene ontology, which is a place in which we find uh, the relationship among different processes at different levels of abstraction. So we'll, we'll take a look at that in a couple slides. Which brings us to gene ontology. This is, uh, in many ways, the big one, because it's been around a while, and uh, 
there are so many different ways that you can apply gene ontology, uh, such as the Go Slim approach that we looked at this morning, uh, or over enrichment, uh, overexpression analysis, etc. That that one can find a lot of different ways that Go fits into our world. So it's very structured, it's very precisely defined, and it uses this controlled vocabulary to describe the roles of genes and gene products. And that means that there's a good deal of clarity about uh, exactly what a given term in this, uh, in this resource means. There are three different organizing principles, and, and Go is distributed in all three ways. That is not to say that every gene that has an annotation in one of them has an annotation in the other category. So you may find that, uh, for example, molecular function is clearer than cellular component, or vice versa. So to look at the dopamine receptor D2, we see that it is the product of human gene DRD2. So from this, uh, once we look in gene ontology for this dopamine receptor, we see that its molecular function is, unsurprisingly, a dopamine receptor activity. The biological process in which it fits sort of contextualizes why dopamine reception matters is synaptic transmission. Synaptic. Does everyone know the word synapse? Many people do? Okay, so the, the, the communication among nerves, uh, among nerve cells. So in this case, the synapses between nerves, the, these uh, junctions between them, uh, is the biological process in which the, this dopamine reception matters. And finally, cellular component. It sits in the plasma membrane. Now, it's a very specialized plasma membrane. I don't think anyone would argue that a synapse is you know, just generic uh, membrane, but this, this is the annotation that's applied to that. So um, I realize I've kind of jumped right past the fact that we use the term ontology at the start. Uh, and like parsimony, I really like to make sure people know what we're talking about. So when we say ontology, we're really dealing in a, a fine branch of philosophy. So it is a theory about the nature of being or the kinds of things that have existence. It's a pretty high scale of order, right? Uh, just trying to build an ontology for uh, um, you know, why I came to work today or why I, uh, why I moved to South Africa. I mean, these are uh, the, the, the scale of all things that have existence is a very big subject of, of study. So the gene ontology is to say, we want to understand the nature of genes and the kinds of genes that, that exist. It's pretty straight, it becomes a little more straightforward when you bring it down to this level. So the, the controlled vocabulary and defined relationships are part of that. So this is all about organizing principles and so on. But here, I want to emphasize these terms. These are relationships that exist between genes. It's not always an is a relationship. We have others. So when you look at a, a subsection of gene ontology, those relationships become clear. So down here, we have programmed cell death. Does anyone uh, have, a fat, have the fancy name for programmed cell death? Apoptosis. Right, oh, apoptosis, great. So apoptosis, programmed cell death, is a type of cell death. And you see that there are different relationships that hang in here. We've got is a part of regulates, positively regulates, negatively regulates, occurs in capable of, capable of part of, right? Lots of different relationships there. So program cell death is a type of cell death. So you know, chaotic cell death is also possible, not, not just the program type. So this is a single organism cellular process which is associated with both single organism process and with cellular process. And together, those are, cellular pro or those are biological processes. So what you can tell is that we've been navigating our way layer by layer down through the biological process tree until we get to apoptosis. And these little colors associated uh, with, these, with these edges tell us which of the relationships tie into that. Now this other, uh, this other image is not using the same color coding, so it's going to be a little harder to tell, but you can see that we have, uh, I believe these are is A and I, and then these, these P's represent part of, I believe. So we have an anchored component of an external cytoplasma membrane that is a anchored component of plasma membrane, which is part of an intrinsic component of plasma membrane, etc. So these relationships help us to connect the different concepts within the gene ontology.
And there are, if we can get our light worked out for the, the image, you want to uh, pull the window open? It's, uh, it's the chain one, yeah, uh, not the other one. Yeah, just rotate that a little bit. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you've done it right. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Hall, hall, hall. There we go. Oh, we have light. If you can still see the slides, we're in good shape, right? OK on the slides? Great. OK, so as usual, we have at least two different kinds of Go annotations, electronic and manual. We saw something very like this in Uniprot, if you remember. The proteins in Swissprot have gone through manual annotation. The proteins in Tremble have only had automated uh, interpretation. So we have both kinds that have been produced here. All of them, however, must be attributed to a source. So you might have uh, an IDA or IMP or IG, IGI. All of these indicate what type of evidence was used to make this claim about, uh, about the, the annotations. And they must indicate what evidence was found to support the GO term uh, or gene or protein association. So all of these uh, come into play. You can have author statements in there. So if you've written a paper on something, you can write to go and say, you should add a link of this sort. You can add it on my, uh, on my credibility. There are a lot of ways you can access information in Go. Frankly, almost any of the tools that do expression analysis or whatever are going to give you some sort of option here. So Amigo2 is a service made available by Go itself. Um, and I think last year I tried to used that for the demonstration, but found that the, the URL wasn't so robust. Maybe that's improved since then. Bioconductor is certainly your friend because it touches almost every kind of algorithm out there, and we see that they have an access by which you can get Go terms uh, computed directly against your gene lists or whatever that you've produced within uh, Bioconductor stuff. I'm sorry, and, and just to remind you, Bioconductor is one of these tool sets that a lot is connected to R. So if you're dealing with your data already in R and want to project them into gene ontology categories, Bioconductor is there for you. The European Bioinformatics Institute has created an interface called QuickGo for accessing it as well. Um, these, I believe, are live links in the PDF, so I think you can just click through and get to the, the interfaces directly. Over at the right, I'm showing some information from uh, uh, from a database that was trying to analyze uh, the results of Go. I think this actually might have been part of the release statistics. And I was asking how many different annotations are available as a function of species. As I mentioned earlier, Homo sapiens is pretty well studied for something that's not a model organism per se. So you can get an awful lot of annotation information for that. And the same is true of mice and rats. These organisms get used so frequently that having up-to-date uh, gene annotations matters. How about G. Gallus? Does anyone recognize that name? G. Gallus? It's a chicken. The chicken has relatively short uh, numbers of annotations by comparison. Rario? Dania Rario, I think is the name. Zebrafish. Uh, zebrafish is pretty well documented by comparison to the chicken. D. Melanogaster, I think most people know the fruit fly. If you haven't got one or two flying around your kitchen, uh, you know, when you bring fruit home, uh, that's, that's a surprise. C. elegans is the worm. We've done some really, really great studies uh, about the molecular biology of the worm. So uh, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of different species that have been annotated well, and uh, taking advantage of it just makes a lot of sense. Now this slide is a little bit old, uh, but I, I wanted to bring it up just the same. Because as I said before, not every gene is going to have useful annotation for you. So when we look at Homo sapiens, we see that on the order of 6,000 different terms exist within Go. And those terms link to 15,228 genes. That's true for the biological process category. Those numbers change a fair bit in terms of the number of terms when we go to molecular function. And the number of cell compartments that we subdivide our, our measurements in uh, within the gene ontology is quite, quite a lot smaller than these. So if you want to get into uh, the finest gradation of biological activity, you're probably going to focus on biological process rather than molecular function, because molecular function has fewer, fewer terms supported by it. The number of genes overall that they connect to is actually pretty good. Something like three, and, uh, three out of four genes for, for uh, homo sapiens have now been linked to some sort of 
biological process or molecular function. Okay, which brings us to keg. We spent some time looking at that today. I think by this time, when you see a dotted quad, you see four numbers connected by periods, you're going to recognize that as an enzyme commission code. And an enzyme commission code allows you to understand how the, um, the enzyme that's a, that catalyzes this function in one species can be mapped to another species. So if you're studying a, uh, a particular molecular function, and you want to think about how you could do it in a, another organism that's more convenient to do research in, doing the mapping via enzyme commission code might be a reasonable way to go. Now it's after lunch. Hopefully, we all have a little bit of caffeine in our systems. So here we're looking at the, the biosynthetic pathways that get us to caffeine. Uh, so if you have uh, paraxanthine and you have the enzyme that maps to 2.1.1.160, you're in good shape because you can synthesize caffeine from that. All right. Now, it's, we're going to talk a little bit about this overexpression representation analysis. You remember the ORA from this morning. Uh, that was a function that we saw supported in WebGestalt. Uh, this is, I, I'm talking about WebGestalt in particular just because it's free and it covers an awful lot of functions and it's been kept nicely up to date. Its initial publication was all the way back in 2005. Let's see, would you guys have been in high school at that point? What's that? Grade four. Grade, grade four. Okay, well, I remember 2005 very clearly. That's quite all right. Uh, and then there was an updated publication from 2013 on the same subject. Okay, so having, having received a pile of, uh, of gene probes that you want to map to genes, it's going to give us a translation service to accomplish that. You can see that at the time this was uh, updated, Eight different organisms had been, had been supported within WebGestalt. You could translate from microarray probe IDs, basically these addresses on the microarrays, genetic variation IDs, if you had, for example, dbSNP information, gene IDs from a whole variety of things. You can see in here MGI and Ensemble and GenBank and so on, huge pile of them, and, and different protein identifiers as well. The software has been uh, well accommodating uh, has, been, has been designed to accommodate proteomics data quite well. So if you're using IPI databases or Uniprot or RefSeq or even ensemble pe peptide IDs, you can still translate those back to gene IDs, which is where this software does all of its uh, evaluation. So those mappings mean you can get to genes, and genes mean WebGestalt can give you some useful feedback on, on what they represent. From that, you can do functional categorization using gene ontology, pathways from three different sources, Network module analysis, something that we'll cover quite a lot more later in, a, in this lecture. Disease and drug associations, and chromosomal location as well. So that's, that's an, awfully, uh, an awfully nice way to think about all these different ways that we might package up sets of genes to show their interrelationships. All right. So I'm going to try to set up the problem that motivates uh, this over-representation analysis. Imagine that you have a, uh, you've done an assay that gave you a report of genes that came back uh, from some experiment. Maybe the, the total number of genes you were, you were measuring here, maybe it was from a spotted microarray, for example. Maybe you had 1,842 genes. That's something like 1 in 10 of the genes in a mammalian proteome, a mammalian genome. So with 1,842 genes, we have done an analysis, maybe a t-test, across all of these 1,842 genes, across replicates. And from that list, 581 were found to differentiate our two cohorts. All right, this is one scenario that comes out. So we didn't measure the whole genome, just a subset of it. From this subset, we found another subset that had significant p-values after multiple testing correction. So now we want to know how much uh, how much, how much overlap do we have in the expected and, and observed genes? So from this set of, of genes, we can see a lot of different pathways represented. But for some particular pathway, we find that we have an intersection of 98 proteins that are associated with a particular pathway of interest. If we were to look at a random assortment, maybe a, a random draw of differential genes, we would see an average of 65 
genes associated with this pathway. So this is saying that when we looked at the set of genes that we discovered to be differential, we noticed that we had a different number of genes matching to this pathway than we would have if we had just been drawing genes at random from the larger pool. Does everyone see that so far? All right, I'm kind of talking to myself sideways on this one, so I want to make sure you're understanding what I'm saying. So what we would like is some sort of figure of merit on this, some, some test statistic that asks, is the fact that we saw 98 genes meaningful compared to the 65 that we should have seen just by random chance? So the overrepresentation method produces a contingency table in order to give us a number on this score. So we've been given a total of m genes where j genes are in the functional group. So j, j of the m are found to be associated with a particular pathway. If we were to pick these n genes, uh, pick n genes randomly from this collection, what's the probability that we would have k or more from the group? You may have remembered I talked a little bit about Fisher's exact test uh, based on the hypergeometric distribution a couple days back. This is one of the ways that this can play out. So we can ask, uh, essentially, under, under a random model, what are the odds that we would see 98 matches, that we would see 99 matches, that we would see 100 matches? We can compute these probabilities by random chance and ask what the sum of those probabilities will be. So if that number is small, that says that the random model is not a very good, uh, is not a very good descriptor of what's happened here, that, it, that what, we, what we observed was astronomically unlikely. That's what a, a very low p-value is going to represent here. So it's all a way of evaluating these overlaps in a much more structured way than simply saying, well, 98 is bigger than 65, so this must be a good hit doesn't work that way. We need to be able to put a, a nice concrete uh, probability on it. So this was originally published in the, that 2005 uh, article uh, that we mentioned. So having, we can perform this assessment across every gene ontology uh, term, if we like. And we can also adjust our p-values because we know that we're doing multiple testing when we're considering more than a thousand different biological terms, for example. So being able to find that some of these produce you know, really extraordinary p-values might be happening by random chance on its own, just because we're testing so many different pathways that could potentially be uh, constructed out of this data set. Uh, okay, well, so in the first case, we were looking at Go terms. I'm sorry, I wanted to point out something about this. Do you remember when we looked at program cell death and saw that uh, its parent was, a, was cell death. The genes that are marked as associated with programmed cell death overlap the set that, that can be mapped to cell death in general. Do you see why that would be? There's a correlation between these two. So when you're looking at a, a vertical stripe of, of these, if you see uh, that, for example, the, the significant values sort of trace up and down in a stripe, that's to be expected because the probability for, uh, for over-representation analysis on this cell is not independent of the p-value you compute for this cell. They overlap in which genes they include. So the evidence that led to this being called uh, a very low probability may also lead to this being called a very low probability. This morning, when we looked at uh, overexpression uh, and at representation analysis, one of the things that you probably noticed was that we had the option to choose biological process or, well, we had bio biological process, uh, cellular compartment, and molecular function. But we also had non redundant biological process, non redundant molecular function, non redundant cellular compartment. What that does is to separate these fields so that we're, we're only considering uh, basically the leaf nodes of this tree. It gives us the ability to avoid the redundant significance that we see in these, ver in these vertical stripes. Okay, I'm not sure I made a lot of sense on that score, but if you needed to explain it, we can always have a, 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 a consultation later on. So, um, We also 
have the ability to use systems like KEG for doing these projections. I talk a lot about gene ontology, and the reason is that a lot of people use gene ontology. But it's hardly the only kind of canonical pathway database out there. Something like wiki pathways you could use, for example. So when, when one has a set of genes that are associated with a particular pathway, like the TGF beta signaling pathway, you can use that information to, uh, to act as your canonical list of, of genes associated with a particular process. So this is coming from KEG rather than gene ontology. The same kind of, the kind, same kind of overexpression analysis is applicable to all kinds of different ways, uh, all kinds of different groupings of, of genes. Now network modules are a rather different way uh, to think about these. Before, we've been talking about uh, very heavily curated databases. For example, in KEG, those maps that we saw had been pretty heavily gone over by humans, and, and canonical lists of genes had been annotated very carefully to that particular map. In this case, though, it may be possible to build network data that are not cut and dried on what belongs in a process. So one way that we think about the relationship between genes is how many steps we have to walk through to get through a protein-protein interaction map, right? So we know that gene A is sometimes, is, is sometimes observed in conjunction with gene B. We see that gene B is sometimes found in connection with gene C, and gene C is found in connection with gene D. So we can then say that A and D have a relationship to each other. It's not a direct relationship. We've never pulled down A and accidentally gotten D as well. But because we can walk from one gene interaction to another, we can make our way from A to D. And the closer they are together in that association, the more likely that they are related in molecular function. So you can create, the, uh, you can infer network modules from these point-to-point -point interactions, these gene-to-gene -gene interactions that allow you to recognize that something like, uh, I don't know, ACAN and LEN2 have a relationship with each other. It's not direct, but there are two different ways that you can take three steps to get from one to the other. So that's, that's hopeful that they have some sort of biological function in common. So these are not always, um, network modules are inferred. They don't have clear molecular functions that are always uh, reliable. So there's, there's less annotation available to us. But it is an equally valid way to infer the association of genes by, these, by uh, serial point-to-point -point interactions getting us from one to the other. So molecular inter uh, sorry, the uh, network modules represent another way that we can run the same overexpression analyses that we did with uh, canonical pathways. So, if we have overexpression analysis, why do we need anything else? We start with the fact that our thresholding can be quite arbitrary. So let us imagine that we have a list of the p-values that we've produced for the genes in this microarray experiment, one cohort versus another. We had our clear differences all the way at the top of the list, and then we had some rather ambiguous lists, uh, ambiguous p-values that were near significance, but they didn't make it underneath the 0.05 threshold. There are some genes near that threshold that really are, uh, that really would uh, show up as significant if you were to redo the experiment. And there are others that are near that boundary under P, the p-value threshold of 0.05 that may be false positives as well. So where we set our threshold is always going to have some number of significantly different genes uh, that were missed and some that we did see and some that we thought were significant but really aren't. So where we set that thresholding may is always going to determine uh, how many genes show up essentially. We don't know how to set that threshold uh, so it's uh, really well set. So the other thing is that just because a gene happens to be over your threshold, even though it happens to have a p-value less than 0.05 after adjustment is, is not a, a, a black and white case. It's not the case where everything above this line is, is gold and everything below it is dross. That's just not how biology works. So 
it seems that the genes that are at the very top should have a little bit more impact on our analysis than those that barely made the cut. Do you see why that would be? You know, if you're, if you're in the Olympics and you don't manage to get a gold, silver, or bronze, it doesn't mean you're a bad swimmer. And, and, and if you were to run the same race ten times, what's to say that the, the racer in, who got uh, finished off of the medal stand with, with fourth might not have gotten a, a bronze, at least, in, in some of the uh, other trials that could be run. So, we would like them to not ignore these, the ordering of p-values. Things that get the most extreme p-value, the lowest that, that uh, was observed, might actually be very meaningful. So, likewise, when we look at these pathways and try to uh, evaluate them, it's clear that some, if you're looking at the caffeine biosynthesis pathway, those genes that produce caffeine directly, we know are related in caffeine metabolism. Genes that consume caffeine directly, yes, very central to caffeine metabolism. But as you step three or four or five biochemical processes away, the association of a gene with caffeine metabolism gets a little weak, wouldn't you say? So, treating a canonical pathway as this block of genes have to do with caffeine, nothing else has anything to do with caffeine, throws away a lot of information that we'd really rather retain. So, gene set enrichment analysis is an approach that starts to solve uh, the first two of those problems well. Um, and I've given the URL for it right here. This software is very widely used, very widely implemented as well. As I mentioned this morning, WebGestalt has a gene set enrichment analysis uh, toolkit built in. So, you know, you don't actually have to run it at the Broad web server or download it from Broad, but they have some really good training materials and tutorial materials uh, available. So, uh, when we look at the method, let's start with the, the kind of data that we've got. We had a bunch of microarrays, we had two cohorts, A and B. We had genes that ranged from way up in A and way down in B to genes that were way down in A and way up in B. We're able to produce t uh, we're able to produce uh, p-values based on some sort of uh, some sort of uh, difference testing, maybe it was a t-test, for these. And this creates a rank where these genes have been turned into this ordering. We now want to know, is this pathway something that, um, that we see a disproportionate low rank for the genes that are differential? So at the top, we have genes that are clearly differential, at the bottom, we've got genes that are clearly not, not differential in this case. I'm trying to remember if these are actually, I'm sorry, I think it's doing correlation with phenotype instead. Sorry about that. So the, the, diff, the, the ends are opposite in, uh, in the orientation. These are genes that are clearly up in A. These are genes that are clearly up in B by comparison. So when we look at these genes, we expect that we're going, if, if, there, if there really is an association between a particular pathway and, and the p-values that, that came out of here, we expect to see a whole bunch of hits on that pathway at low p-values. And as we get to low p-values, uh, as we get to rather higher p-values, p-values that are not even remotely uh, considered significant, we stop acquiring hits to this pathway. So our probability sort of drops back down again. So, as we accumulate hits to this pathway, this ES score rises. And as you start going through more and more genes without acquiring new hits, that signal falls off. So in effect, we measure how high we were able to get off of, out of alignment of this, just the random accumulation of genes to pathways to evaluate whether a pathway is in significant linkage with the, uh, with the differential genes or not. So there's no 0.05 threshold in here. If we're simply going to sort the genes by how strongly they correlate with phenotype. And once you've got that, you're ready to go to GSEA. And GSEA will then provide an assessment of whether this pathway exhibits a non-random relationship with the differences you saw. So we've already covered a fair bit in pathways here. We've looked at organizing genes in terms of the pathways. We've looked at gene ontology as a very special kind of pathway. 
uh, assessment, in, except in that it has controlled vocabulary terms associated with it. When we got to enrichment analysis, we focused on both the hypergeometric over-representation over analysis and the more non-parametric gene set enrichment analysis. But in every case, the major limitation came the, 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 from the fact that existing knowledge of gene function is very, very far from complete. If you don't have a good, um, a good annotation of what these genes actually mean, your ability to associate them with differences is basically nil. So from here, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about graph theory because you need to understand what, what terms we use in, in talking about these. I threw a pretty hefty one at you a bit ago. It was the network module, if you remember. So let's try to get from here to there. We start with nodes. I think everyone has a kind of a notion around here. Typically in our gene-gene uh, interaction maps, the nodes represent genes, for example. These are the, the sort of physical concepts that exist in the, in the, the graph space. So another name for a node is a vertex. Uh, it generally represents an object or a concept, particularly genes or proteins. I think everyone can feel pretty good about that term. Similarly, an edge generally represents a relationship among these genes or proteins. So this edge is always going to connect just two of the nodes. And generally speaking, it, it'll be directional if you have a, a directional graph, such as one for transcription factors, or it will be undirected, it won't be directional, if you have a uh, if you have an association between proteins, for example, that isn't causal, but rather just reflects the fact that when we pull down one, we get the other. Okay. Now, when we use the name degree, this is one of these terms that always shows up when graph theory appears. We're asking how many different edges are associated with this node, and we may split that. Right. So we might have uh, in an undirected graph. We might just say, well, there are five neighbors to this particular node. It's got five edges leading out of it to five different uh, neighbors. You might subdivide that by saying, there are this many incoming edges and this many outgoing edges as well. So you would give those by sort of the in degree or the out degree uh, for, for that node. All right, and when we talk about a connected component, we're talking about a set of interconnected nodes that have no edges to nodes outside the set. So let us imagine the, uh, the extreme case of a connected, a connected, uh, sorry, connected component. This is maybe a set of five genes, for example, and A is connected to B, A is connected to C, A is connected to D, A is connected to E, B is connected to C, B is connected to D, B is connected to E, etc. These five nodes form what we call a click, completely connected. So something like that, uh, if it has no connections to any other five genes, represents a connected component. Now, are you required to have complete interconnection to have a connected component? Definitely not. Consider the simple example of a pair of genes, sorry, a, a, a trio of, of genes. A connects to B, B connects to C, but there's no connection from A to C. So that's an example of what would be a connected component, so long as none of them connect to anything else. It's a pretty simple example. All right, so I already mentioned the possibility of a click. What is the smallest click uh, that we typically see? Well, it would be the pair. You have a pair of nodes, they've got one edge between them, There's nothing, and, and they have no other connections. So this is a, a two-click, we call it. You might have three points, and they, are, they form a, this nice little triangle. Each of, the, each of those nodes has an edge to the other, the other two. A triangle is also a click, it's a three-click. If you have a four-click, it doesn't look like a square. It looks like a square with an X through it because the corners are also connected to the opposite corner. So a click represents a maximal amount of connection in some subset of nodes. So imagine that you have a set of nodes that are very strongly connected within themselves than outside it. Now, I've, I've introduced a new concept here. And this is uh, essentially to put a weight on the edge. We might, have a reason, we might have reason, based on our experimentation, to say that the edge between these nodes is a stronger edge than the edge that this one experiences with the other. You might have a very, a very low p-value, for example, associated with one association, but a relatively marginal p-value that, that allows you to construct the other. 
So now we have weighted edges. For something like that, being able to spot a module, uh, the set of closely related genes uh, becomes feasible. I talked a little bit about path length just a moment ago. This asks, how many, how many uh, lengths must I travel through in order to get from A to J, for example? Now, of course, if, there are, if there's no pathway between them, that's undefined. But if they are connected to each other, if there is a path leading from one to the other, you can ask, what is the shortest path from one to the other? All right. Now, hub is a really important concept in the context of biological networks. And it's because in most of the biological systems we look at, we do not have a uniform distribution of edges across genes. Instead, we frequently see that in biology, we get nodes of high degree that act as sort of control points within our biological networks. We're going to talk about that in just a moment as we discuss scale-free networks. So when we think about biological networks, in the very first, uh, sorry, in that, that image I showed you in four colors uh, from graph is, we saw that there are different kinds of evidence that lead to these biological graphs. So a protein-protein interaction network is almost always telling us that these proteins have some sort of physical interaction. Maybe they have a binding interface, and they form heterodimers or something. So in an interface like this, we have a, our, our judgment is based on a physical interaction, and we say that it's an undirected interaction as well, because where A is, so is B. You could look at it the other way, that where B is, so is A. In a signaling network, you have proteins that are interacting with other proteins, but in this case it's a directed interaction because one is impacting the other in a way that the other is not impacting the one. And so it's, it's a directional relationship. We have transcription factors, we have microRNAs, these are gene regulatory networks. Again, we're working off of physical interaction. These interactions are directed, so we would say this microRNA affects these genes, but we wouldn't say that those genes affect that microRNA. Co-expression is quite different. It's an undirected relationship. It's a, a correlation of appearance across uh, different experiments. So it, it's a, a co-expression called an undirected. And genetic networks, of course, uh, can be represented in this way as well. So the type of network that we construct from the data tells us something about where those data came from. All right, three concepts everyone should have in understanding biological networks. For at first, when computer scientists started using networks to model what biological systems uh, looked like, uh, they thought it would be useful to construct random networks uh, that would let them study the properties of these things. But they soon found that these random models did not capture what the actual structure of these data, of, of these data look like. So we start with this concept built around hubs. By the way, this paper from 2004 is really worth your reading if you want to understand this subject in some depth. So a scale-free network means that not every, not every gene in this network is equally important in helping us navigate it. Instead, what we find is that there's a... Uh, sorry, do I have another slide about this concept in particular? I don't think I do. Well, so when you have hubs in a, in a network, in, in a, uh, in a scale-free network, you have a, uh, what's called a power distribution of degree as you go across this network, which is to say that rather than having edges randomly distributed among all the different nodes that you might be connecting, you find that some nodes are really, really strong attractors of edges. As a result, uh, just a few genes actually give us um, a lot of the connectiveness in our gene-gene interaction networks. Which means that if a particular gene that's a hub gets taken out by mutation, huge, intera huge interruptions to cell function take place. So hubs have a disproportionately important uh, role to play in the fu proper function of the cell. Okay. Because of this hub network, uh, the, because of this hub property, we also get this, this small world phenomenon about our biological networks. Has anyone uh, ever heard of the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon? Okay, maybe it's a US thing. If, if you're a movie buff, um, one of the things that, that you can benefit from is the fact that Kevin Bacon has starred in movies with a lot of very famous people. 
which means that if you're ever trying to figure out how actor A knows actor B, you can frequently find out it goes on a route through Kevin Bacon. So, Footloose? Okay, right, Kevin Bacon, good. So, this is a small world phenomenon. People have actually tried experiments of this sort. They, uh, they mail boxes to complete strangers all over the world and ask them uh, to send the box on to the person they know who is most likely to know this stranger in a completely different country. And they ask how many hops these packages must go through in the mail system in order to get from a random person on Earth to a random person on Earth. And this small world phenomenon captures that. Our genes are like this as well. That if you have a genes that you've chosen arbitrarily within your genome, the number of hops you must go through, the number of direct gene-gene interactions you must go through, is usually quite small to get from a random gene to a random gene. This is a property that falls out of having a scale-free network. The other part of this is hierarchical and modular. We have a... If you look at, on a very small scale, genes tend to work in very small cooperative networks. And when you look at them at a slightly larger scale, you see that those networks, those tightly connected uh, networks of, of small numbers of genes interact with other such modules of genes. And those nexi of hubs, uh, sorry, those nexi of modules in turn work with other nexi. And those, those super nexi work with other super nexi. So what we have is in fact a fractal uh, degree of complexity as we look through our system, uh, through gene-gene interactions. We see that at very close levels, in the, in the direct vicinity of a particular gene in a, a gene-gene network, there are strong associations. And at this higher level, those modules in turn interact at higher level. So we call that a hierarchical modular system. Okay. Lots of tools are out there for visualizing these networks. I, um, I had an old, sli an old slide on the subject and I started looking through all the URLs that had been given for tools uh, that were published in that paper from like 2007. What I found was that there's an incredible amount of link rot. Have you heard of link rot? Link rot means that from the time you publish a paper, it's usually a matter of less than, say, seven years, that at least 50% of the URLs you read in the literature are no longer live. So if you think about all the papers I published while I was at Vanderbilt, if you looked for the URL that I gave for downloading our software, you find that that URL is no longer live. And suddenly you're stuck with Google in order to figure out whether that tool is still distributed anywhere. So when I looked through the assorted tools, I saw that there had been a, a huge diminution in how many of them were still live. On the other hand, Cytoscape has been growing in the number of users extraordinarily rapidly. So it seems that, in some respects, Cytoscape is kind of gobbling up from the competition uh, all, the, all the capabilities of these other systems that have existed in, in uh, our, our software ecosystem. But these are still viable, and I've included links in the PDF that will get you to them. So Cytoscape gives us the ability to integrate data on a gene level and to visualize it through networks. This software is uh, a rather remarkable uh, bit of, it, of software engineering. It's been worked on continuously for more than a decade. We're looking at, what, 16 years so far? No, sorry, we're only at, uh, this is 2017, so it's 14 years of, of effort so far. Now, uh, I'm going to put down the pointer for just a moment and have another human interest story. I know you love them so much. So um, I want to tell you about my experience in grad school. The Department of Molecular Biotechnology at the University of Washington was brand new. Brand new. Big money from Bill Gates had set up this massive department. They hired the guy, the genius who had helped to create the automated DNA sequencer, Lee Hood. They convinced him to leave Pasadena and come up to Seattle and found this new department. And he assembled this team of all-stars around him. Geniuses in bioengineering, people who were experienced with FRET, people who knew about SNPs, people who knew about proteomics. It was an amazing group of people. But it's always a little hard to bootstrap a department into existence. So for the first few years of the department, they had recruited students 
by way of the Department of Bioengineering. So bioengineering was okay with this, but they would really rather that the Department of Molecular Biotechnology find its own students. So MBT started an admissions process. And I applied, and a bunch of other people applied, and we all gathered at Seattle to do our interviews. And I got, to, I got accepted. I got accepted to grad school at the University of Washington. I was really excited. And so in my very first semester there, I ended up uh, meeting my, my other classmate. We had only two students who were brought into this division that very first year. And the other guy had just graduated with his master's. Is that a phone? Oh, OK. So I didn't recognize the sound. It was like, well, someone's throwing a party. All right, so, um, so there were two students brought in. And this other fellow was named Trey. Kind of a weird name, right? Trey? I was wondering if it was anything, but in fact, it's his real name. So Trey and I uh, had different backgrounds. I entered the PhD program directly from my, my bachelor's degree. There is no honors in, uh, in the United States graduate program at all. Trey, on the other hand, had already gone to grad school. He'd gone in, uh, I think, mechanical engineering at MIT, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Could be wrong about that. Anyway, he already had his MIT master's, and that impressed the socks off of me. I was like, be brief, who am I up against? Well, so as time went on, it became clearer and clearer to me that Trey had a very clear and distinct notion of what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to be a professor, and he wanted to be a professor who made systems biology go. He was really excited. So he ended up being a, a student directly underneath uh, Lee Hood himself, and I, would, I became a uh, bioinformatics graduate student under the lab of John Yates. Now, John Yates went on to be very famous in the space of proteom proteomics, and he certainly, uh, by, by writing on his coattails, I know that I got a lot of opportunities that I wouldn't have had if I'd gone to another lab. But Trey, as I said, was a powerhouse in his own right. So Trey graduated with his PhD a lot faster than I did. It took him seven years to make it through a PhD program. Appalling, right? But he made it through quickly. He got an assistant professorship quite quickly at University of California, San Diego. And what is the first tool that he publishes out of his lab? Freaking Cytoscape. The guy owns network inter integration and visualization and has, for more than a decade, very, very widely sought speaker. Piles of grad students and research scientists coming out of his lab. He's amazing. So, you know, there are days when I pat myself on the back. I made tenure at Vanderbilt, blah, blah, blah. But I, can, I always have to remember that it took me forever to get through grad school because I wasn't really sure how I was doing it. And the guy I was in grad school with was always shining brighter. That doesn't mean that I was going to be a failure. So I just want to say, the people that you know in grad school today, they, they may seem like ordinary Joes, but you don't know which ones are going to go out there and just shine. So it's worth thinking about. All right, I'm done with my little soapbox for the moment. But here we are, sight escape. If you're talking about network visualization in biology, in biology, if you're talking about network data integration on a large scale, you're probably talking about Cytoscape. Cytoscape is amazing software. There are great tutorials out there, piles of, of documentation to get you started. And at, the, at base, it's really well-written software to give you a, a great ability to do visualization. So I suspect that at some point in your life, you will find it useful to have this software. I hope you take advantage of it. All right. I've already covered this point a little bit, but I'm just going to emphasize it again. Proteins that lie closer to each other in a protein interaction network, which is to say they don't have to be direct interactors, but if A interacts with B and B interacts with C, we can infer an indirect relationship between A and C. The closer they lie to each other, the more likely they are to have a similar function and to be involved in the same biological process. So network-based gene function prediction is one of these tricks that we use to try to apply a, a functionality to a protein if we don't know it in advance. If, if it interacts with things that are part of a biological process, we think this one might too. So the, uh, we can also use this for disease gene prediction. If we know that gene A is involved in uh, breast cancer, then we might find that gene B that interacts with it is as well. This is a uh, plot from the Sharan and all uh, manuscript back in 2000, 2007 that substantiates this, that when we, uh, that we look at uh, semantic similarity in Go, we see that there's a very strong relationship among genes that directly interact, for example. 
All right, it is possible as well to try to infer these hierarchical relationships among genes. So we see that we have a bunch of orange blobs here. These are genes. We have another set that's, uh, that's um, in sort of a magenta, perhaps. Maybe lilac, what would you go with on that one? We'll just call them pink for now. So we've got this dashed line that reflects the relationship between these two. This is the hierarchical modular structure coming out. We can then associate this big blob with a dotted line around it with those red, uh, red genes down at the bottom and call those all the red set. We can do a similar combination of different scales of modules on the right to give us this green set and then from that build out the set. So what we see is that the hierarchical and modular uh, model that we use for understanding how genes interact on a large and small scale, we can deconstruct that in order to give us a linear organization of these data. So the net gestalt tool that we were going to include in the, uh, in the tutorial this morning, but we left off for mostly time reasons, uh, gives us the ability to see how these modules split out across the entire genome. So you can see uh, this structure shows a hierarchical modular structure. The, the genes within that small green set, there's a small number of them, can be brought together with this yellow set to produce a larger yellow set. That yellow set, in turn, has different neighbors that can be combined together to produce a larger module set until you get to the full set of all genes. So if we zoom in very, very closely on this very narrow region, we see all of these different genes that have been linearized together. We can visualize data like microarrays or proteomes or both simultaneously by showing the p-values that pull out, of, pull out of these individual genes. All of these data can be incorporated into NetGestalt when you're trying to make a data portal for someone to evaluate your data externally, having a visualization like this is a very handy uh, tool set to do. So the NetGestalt uh, framework allows you to publish data sets in this way uh, for easier comprehension. So it's now very valuable to build your assessment of your data on the basis of a pathway or network rather than doing it just on a laundry list of genes or proteins. Your biological interpretability will get a lot better, and you'll be able to incorporate more data to evaluate which of these elements has a significant p-value for association. Biological pathways are built on a categorical basis. Genes are or are not on this list. Biological networks, however, tend to borrow from graph theory for a lot of their interesting analyses. GSEA and overrepresentation analysis are very, very widely used methods. GSEA is ludicrously common when you get to uh, microarray data sets, for example. So these are very common statistical tests. They're, they're worth knowing about. Uh, certainly, you can do an awful lot uh, using hypergeometric distribution-based statistics for evaluating count data in particular. So uh, this marks the end of the, of the, uh, of the biological pathways and networks uh, lecture. And it also represents the end of our eight lecture series uh, on bioinformatics. Some of you will, will want to steer your projects towards bioinformatics, and we welcome you. We're glad you're here. The rest of you will probably head into projects that are more associated with immunology, molecular biology, genetics. But all of you will continue to use bio, uh, bioinformatics methods. It's, it's inescapable if you're going to be in biomedical research. You must have some exposure to bioinformatics. Your education does not stop here. This is the stop, perhaps, of the didactic education you're going to get uh, from, from the field of bioinformatics. But there are bioinformatics investigators in this division who are ready to work with you. When you have questions about your data, what's the best way to design this experiment so that I get the, the most information out of it? I want to create my data analysis strategy before I do the experiment. Please come to us with questions like that. Um, we're here to help. Uh, and we each of you, uh, we each of us, want to see each of you excelling in biomedical research. So that means you're, you're going to need skills in this space, and we, we hope to help you develop those as you move along in your careers. So thank you very, very much. It's been a real, a real joy to work with you all for these last eight days. And uh, you can trust the immunology folks who follow me. They really do know what they're doing, and uh, they're, they're quite talented people. I, I really respect and admire the people I get to work with in this division. So I will uh, look forward to hearing from you uh, Someday, six months from now, when you send me an email saying, Dr. Tab, what was that you were saying about X? <laughs> <laughs>
I look forward to messages like that. It means that you, you remember that your bookmark, you know, that you, you have a bookmark in your mind for the, 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 the types of topics that we've addressed in this course. And I want to hear from you. I want to see you succeed. All right. I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.